We read this morning from the Apostle Paul's letter to the early church at Rome. We read from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you didn't know, we are ramping up to another presidential campaign season. And if you have been following along in the news, if you have been reading the newspapers or seeing online, there has been some media coverage uh, recently regarding the age of some of the candidates been some focus on that and there are several of the current candidates the crop of folks who are running for president on both sides of the aisle uh, that they are over the age of 70 and this has caused some uh, morbid speculation uh, about whether or not they would actually survive through uh, the period of time that they would be serving now the researchers assure us that there is no reason to worry, which comes as good news uh, to all of us. They call these folks who are so active, uh, so alert, so capable at that age, super agers, that's what they are called. Um, And the folks that are um, super agers that are running for president right now have a couple of advantages, the researchers tell us. One, notably, is that they have sufficient wealth uh, to provide for themselves not just the the basic needs, but the finest of health care that is available, and that gives them an edge. Uh, They also, because of their socioeconomic stature and their uh, place in that upper 1%, not just of the, those who are fortunate enough to have good health, but to have the extra things that enable you to maintain that good health, uh, access the kinds of uh, um, assistance that you need, the kinds of things that protect you against the kinds of incidents that uh, might uh, bring your life expectancy down, and they're expected to, to continue to do well for many years. Now, had these super-agers, had any of those folks that we call super-agers lived in an earlier day, we might refer to them as being full of days. That's the term that the Bible uses for people who have lived not just long, but lived well. The people like Abraham and Job and others, they were described as being full of days. Apostle Paul knew what it was like to live fully. He wrote that knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Paul was one who ran the race with perseverance. He had fought the good fight, kept up the faith. He was no stranger to the kinds of physical or spiritual disappointments and challenges, and yet he boasted in his suffering in this letter that he writes to the Romans. Now, Paul wasn't prescribing suffering. He wasn't saying that suffering was something that you wanted to do or should desire to do or should be pursuing or should wish on anyone else. Rather, Paul was describing suffering in our lives. And he said that when we suffer, and we will all suffer in some way in our life, 
find the hope in the enduring of it. Now, the wisdom that Paul wrote with, this wisdom, comes from a uh, kind of life experience that takes time. It takes years to accumulate that kind of wisdom, and it makes sense as we read through his description here. It, it takes time to suffer. You can't just suffer briefly. It takes time to endure that kind of suffering. It takes time to develop the kind of character that is created from suffering, like a, a pearl that is produced by the friction in the shell. It takes time to develop the hope that can be found in suffering and enduring from our suffering. And then it takes time to wait around and, and perhaps be disappointed and yet find out that there is no need to be disappointed because God is with us in our suffering. And that recognition takes time and the wisdom that is distilled from all of that takes time. The wisdom that Paul wrote with, the wisdom that he describes in this uh, short passage, takes a lifetime. It takes aging. It takes getting older. Now, we don't talk much in our culture about aging at least not in a way that embraces aging, a way that celebrates aging. We are much more likely to talk about aging in negative terms. Uh, we're more likely to talk about aging in the, in the context of fighting against it, or denying it, or hiding it, or bemoaning it, or despairing it. And the reality is we don't talk about aging much in the church either. We wring our hands, perhaps, about the demographics of the church, but we really don't honestly talk about aging, and particularly not about aging well. Rarely will you hear that be preached on. And maybe we should do more of that in the church because the Bible does describe aging well as a, a blessing. And so let's talk. Let's talk about aging well and, and, and what that looks like. Aging well is about embracing getting older. Again, the culture paints a very negative picture for us here about the effects of age, that we are to be ashamed of that, of the gray hair or the wrinkles or the diminishment of our physical strength or sexual performance. And there are multi-billion dollar industries that are profiting every day from that shame and that denial, helping us to avoid the effects if we can of aging, to reverse them if that were possible through, through uh, surgeries or pills. Aging well is a rejection of society's negative view, society's detrimental, demeaning attitude towards getting older. It's having the kind of attitude that I met with a parishioner at the first church I was at, and she walked up to me, and she introduced herself. She says, hi, I'm May. I'm 100 years old, and I drive the old people to their doctor's appointments. <laughs> Referring to people who were significantly younger than she was chronologically. And she um, did get a 30-year mortgage at age 80 and tells a lively story about what it was like to deal with a real estate agent who suggested that she wasn't entitled to get one of those. And she said, oh, I think so. I think I'm going to live through that. Aging well is about growing a spiritual 
portfolio. Our culture says that we want to develop a different kind of a portfolio, right? One that involves earthly riches because we know you can't retire unless you have riches. And it's true that as we age, we do require more support, more resources, people to care for us. And, and if we are to avoid the financial ruin that we can fall into from the cost of health care. But that's not the kind of portfolio that's involved with aging well. Aging well, the portfolio we want is the one that comes from being a member of the body of Christ. We know that being the body of Christ is a good investment, not just for the very distant future after this life, but as the researchers now tell us, it's a pretty good investment for this life as well because what we're discovering is that people who come to church on Sunday and care for each other and drive each other to the doctor's office stay healthier and live longer. It's actually a pretty good investment. Aging well is about cultivating spiritual discernment. The prophet Anna, if you might recall, was well into her 80s when she recognized that Jesus was Messiah. When you're older, you can see a bigger picture. The woman who was caught in adultery, that uh, story that Jesus told, that was the older men who put down their stones first. The older men who were willing to own their own sin. Getting older, I would mention as an aside, does not entitle you to get your way. It may actually be the opposite. It's setting aside perhaps of greater authority in order to exercise the kind of judgment that those men exercised. Aging well is about accepting the inevitability of our mortality. We are enabled to live as believers, to live by faith every day with the hope that the Apostle Paul wrote about because we know that death is more than just the mere completion of our earthly lives. Death, death is the door to a new life that perhaps is beyond our vision, but is not beyond our faith. Aging well means that we recognize the fact that we are all, all of us, going to die one day. But that's not an excuse to stop living. This is not, as some people like to joke in the culture, God's waiting room. Our lives are meant, meant to be lived and spent. Our bodies meant to be used up. The, the gifts that we receive are meant to be shared as a blessing to others, no matter what our age and whatever those gifts might look at, and they might change over time. Aging well is about sharing the care, sharing the care with one another and with those who need we know that the population is aging. The demographics are such that there are more and more people every year who are becoming more physically fragile, more financially on shaky ground. People who are outliving, outliving their health perhaps, their finances, maybe even family members and friends. And the response of the culture is to allow an epidemic of elder abuse and neglect to, to reject the needs of those people when those needs are the greatest. And yet we know that aging well 
for almost everyone, the number one request is to age in place, to stay in my home and to live the life that I desire there. And yet people need care assistants and caregivers sometimes to enable that to happen. And there are caregivers who want to help people age in place, and yet they may lack some of the resources that are necessary for them to both care for someone and also to continue to work and to support their own families. Or they might just need some respite from caring for someone. There are many people in this church who are caring for other people now and know that better than I. This church is blessed. Grace Covenant has been richly blessed with, with resources, buildings, and the financial wherewithal to continue to support those buildings to allow for us to provide that kind of care for others in our community, really impact a community in an area where there is tremendous need these days. And your session has recently approved a new three-year commitment to do so, to renew the relationship with the Share the Care that is right here on our church property, a place that provides senior adult care and Alzheimer's respite place for 40 care recipients whose families might not otherwise be able to care for them in the way that they desire and need to be cared for now. And because you and people who have been members of this church before make that available, that's, that's 40 people who are allowed to continue to do what they want to do, which is to age in place with some help, allowing those families to continue to work and to support their own families. Now, in previous years, this, this church, members of this congregation, might have had more of a direct relationship with, with Share the Care's predecessor, uh, which is because you shared literally the space as well as the care and the chairs needed to be moved around so you could use it as a fellowship hall on some days and allow the visiting nurses and others to be there on other days. And, and perhaps over the last 10 years where that has not been the case, there might have been a little falling away of awareness of the impact and significance of that ministry. And I would invite you to become more aware, to, to reestablish that kind of support of not just knowing that it's there, but actually being a part of that, as, as I have invited you to do in previous weeks, to be aware of all who use this property on Monday through Saturday and not just Sunday, and, and, and in our small blessings, child care, the same thing last week. I would invite you to, to be praying for the care recipients, the people who come and, and stay on our property Monday through Friday, 7 o'clock to 6 p.m., to care for their families, to care for the staff that ministers to them throughout the day, to continue to support that resident mission of the church through, in part, the church budget, to help with special events, and there'll be a um, red grocery sack uh, Christmas gift uh, drive that will be coming soon. Even to volunteer, there are members of this church who volunteer and minister uh, in that way directly to those who are at Share the Care. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, we read about how in that day, Every third year, the people took up a special tithe for widows and orphans. This church has recently renewed another three-year commitment to share the care. When people ask you whether or not what we do here in church is relevant in some way to what's going on in the world, you say, absolutely. We are blessed here at Grace Covenant to, to be providing some small amount of support to the most vulnerable in our society. 
encourage you to continue to do that as we are blessed to be a blessing to others.